100 billion dollars. That is what Africa needs to bridge its infrastructure deficit. Well, that's according to the World Bank. According to participants here at the Africa Finance Corporation 2017 Summit, the time to walk the talk is now. I'm Onyi Sunday. Give me 30 minutes of your time as I take you through highlights from the AFC Live 2017 edition. With $100 billion needed annually, the yawning gap in Africa's infrastructure development cannot be overemphasized. The factors widening the gap and solutions required to fix the challenges is what the summit aims to address. It's my privilege to welcome you today to AFC Live 2017, the second edition of our Infrastructure Investment Summit. 2017 marks AFC's 10th anniversary this summit is designed to look back over the last decade to assess the lessons we've learned, the progress we've made, and collectively to plan for the future. According to Andrew Ali, the president and CEO of the AFC, bridging the infrastructure investment gap is what the corporation set out to achieve from inception. Ten years after, the AFC has 14 member countries and has invested approximately $4 billion across 30 countries in Africa. We, we cannot forget that unless corporations like the AFC recognize what is important to do in these times, the next 10 years will indeed be very, very difficult years for our own economies, for African economies indeed. We'll be relying on the AFCs, especially our own uh, DFIs, to do much more. We'll be relying on them to show much more leadership and to take greater risks. There's no question at all that all of what we require, all of what is needed, will not be provided just by, the, by governments. As a matter of fact, it is very clear that governments cannot finance the huge infrastructure needs of, uh, the, of, of most countries. As a matter of fact, without the private sector, it's completely impossible for governments to even finance current infrastructure needs. To take Nigeria, for example, all our refineries put together at the moment does not produce 600,000 barrels of oil. We don't refine 600,000 barrels of oil. And I'm just even talking about nameplate capacity and not what exactly is happening. But one single private sector investor is building the largest single line refinery, 650,000 barrels of oil. So there's no question at all that governments simply cannot compare with the power of the private sector and with the resources that the private sector can pull together. And it's the AFCs that can bring the private sector, de-risk government to a certain extent, and bring the private sector and public sector together to deliver on the kinds of infrastructure needs that our country requires. Funding remains a major constraint in developing Africa's infrastructure. The reality of Africa's infrastructure funding and innovative financing is what this panel hopes to address. There's a reason that we're bullish on Africa, and it's, it's actually not to, do with it's not to do with power, it's to do with education. Uh, when President Obasanjo first took power in the late 70s, just 7% of kids were at secondary school in Nigeria. And that made everything that has happened, I think, in the next 20 to 30 years, explicable, because there was such a, a lack of human capital. But thanks to him and thanks to some of the reforms that have happened since then, education has come through. So Nigeria can escape its present levels of per capita income. But to make that happen, it has to have power. Uh, and this is, in my view, the next most essential progress. And I think the, the sources of finance have changed dramatically since the late 70s and the early 80s. Why am I referencing the 80s? Because the last time oil prices crashed, the government had no money to invest in infrastructure and in power. Uh, and that is a similar problem today. Five years ago, I helped conceive a debate that was uh, done at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and I called it de-risking Africa. I took a lot of flack from, uh, I think it was uh, the president of South Africa, who said, what are you saying? You're saying Africa is a risky place to do business? You want to talk about political uncertainty. And that's a difficult, difficult animal to grasp. 
how do we get more certain than the elections that we are holding? How do we get more certain than the money that we're pouring into education, than the commitment to funding infrastructure that, we, that you had uh, the, the former president talking about? Well, I think the first thing I'd say is that I came here thinking I knew quite a lot, but last night I sat, in, sat next to three senior economists, and now I realize that I know nothing. So I, <laughs> but Charlie here um, forecast the length of the speech much better than the others, so I'd go with him. Um, I think there's a number of questions. There, there is cash, but why would people put it in? in context of currency issues, I call them the three C's, the currency issues, certainty issues, and finally, nobody's mentioned yet, but corruption issues. They are very significant barriers, or uh, which one has to de-risk as best one can. And Let's this, call them the three C's, right? Yeah. Certainty, currency, corruption. Well, it, I think within that you get most things. Looking back at the UK, for example, when we did PPPs back in the 90s, okay. um, our National Audit Office looked at that and came up with, there are some very good things coming out of that. You got cash, you got jobs done on time, you got things on spec, but it was inflexible. There was a lack of commerciality and the returns to the equity funders hadn't really been thought through. So the public perception of those, and it still is, that it was bad. So if you look for certainty, the first thing is, can, the, can people do the job? We talked about education, but capacity building is a common responsibility. You asked about the private sector. What the private sector can do is support the public sector in building capacity. Government does it, NEPA does it, the DFIs do it. I want to come back with a question for all of you around fiscal and monetary policy and how perhaps we need more innovation on that front to reduce the cost of funding some of these infrastructure projects in Africa. Because when you look at how other countries around the world have responded when they've got crises, I think it's very different. To us, we go orthodox, orthodox, orthodox all the time. Let's think out of the box. But I want to ask you one more difficult question before I leave you. The question is, you say government needs to take more steps to de-risk some of these projects. What about the private sector? What role can they play? How can they also de-risk these projects? Until you allow domestic capital into infrastructure across Africa, you probably won't get the, the serious mileage you require to be able to develop infrastructure to the level and capacity that it needs to, it needs to serve the continent. Because offshore foreign money will come because it's going to get a return, it's, it, it, it's, it makes sense for them to invest in it, and they, they have a portfolio across the globe. But local money will do local stuff on a long-term basis because their, their portfolio is local. Assuming now, it's there. Yeah, I mean, South Africa has tons of point pension money. Nigeria has tons of pension money. But the sector has so many risks that you need to de-risk the sector. Uh, political risk, as you said, is a key challenge because these are long-term projects. And you want to be sure that you're putting money into long-term projects over a 20, 25, 30-year period, that there's going to be no dislocation of the agreements or, or tariffs or on all the various agreements you, you've, you've put into to be able to finance the project itself. The successes recorded in AFC would not have been possible without its founders a group of men who set an idea into motion. This is uh, uh, a dream dreamt by Africans, conceived by Africans, uh, nurtured by Africans, delivered by Africans, executed by Africans, and sustained by Africans. So we're all, all like that. So for me, um, it means we can do it. AFC was a dream to pro provide that kind of platform to mobilize African capital and to move across borders where African capital infrastructure can become, as the missing link, begin to fill in the missing dots in terms of linking this small, or if you might call it, the disarticulated, Belgium, as it were. AFC was supposed to fill that void. And today, that experiment seems to have been working extremely well. I've seen how my man has worked out. Look at the rating of AFC. You know, triple A rating, an African institution domiciled here in, uh, in Nigeria. If I assess the leadership of AFC, I'll talk about two things. One is the governance standard and practices at AFC. Yeah. You know, it's something 
is work class. And sitting there, I serve on the governance committee and also a risk. And I like how things are done at the FC. And no wonder they continue to get the kind of rating he gets today. As the founders reflect on the journey so far, the future of the AFC is top on their minds. I see an AFC that will become a household name uh, everywhere in Africa. I see an AFC that will be competing or if you like complementing the World Bank equivalent, the IFC uh, or if not overtaking for our health. In 10 years time I see an AFC with membership, I'm talking about country membership, because now you have about 14 or so country members, is it? In 10 years, I, I want to envision an AFC with the 54 African countries as member nations. That's in the country. Begin to create an advocacy arm that will help to engage the African government. Because infrastructure does not do well where government does not play a critical role. It's all important to engage with our political leaders to create the right environment that will enable this capital when you bring it into stay in Africa. That is what I want to see AFC play very well. Innovation has been key to the AFC's success story. In the words of the corporation's president, Andrew Ali, engineering Africa's solutions to African challenges is what the AFC is about, more of which the continent looks forward to. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll bring you more highlights from the African Finance Corporation 2017 Summit. Welcome back. It's the AFC Live 2017 edition. The theme, the infrastructure revolution. Addressing challenges that hinder this revolution continues to top discussions here at the conference. According to the World Economic Forum, Africa needs to find immediate, sustainable solutions to solve critical problems on its continent. Problems that threaten to hinder its next phase of development. The summit was an opportunity for countries to discuss how to kickstart this needed revolution. I'd like, if I may, ask all of you to paint a picture of what is happening in your respective countries to bridge the infrastructure gap, because it's a race against time. And I will start with the Honorable Minister from Uganda, sir. Maybe before you talk about the infrastructure gap, as a Pan-Africanist, there are other two gaps which we should bear in mind every time we talk about infrastructure. One is the question of peace on the continent. The other one is integration. Because you can't talk about infrastructure until and unless those are in place. So when we are discussing these issues, I pray that we keep that back in, in, at the back of our mind. Now, as for Uganda, we are working, currently we are tarmacking 32 roads. Soon, I have been asked to look for money to tarmac another eight roads, and those are called the oil roads. You know, we have also discovered the oil like you Nigerian people here. Uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Acting President, we have learned from you here. We have benchmarked on you here as far as oil is concerned. We don't want to export our crude oil and then re-import finished products. Dollar-denominated financing in emerging markets creates risks, which make investors nervous. The need to develop local currency financing solutions 
was a hot topic at the summit. So that means that um, in a changing world like we are right now, there is a need for uh, institutions, and here, whether you talk about the central bank, you talk about the commercial banks, you talk about the development finance institutions, there is a need for us to think about how do we structure um, domestically uh, denominated facilities where currency uh, shocks uh, do not really impact on repayment and the, and the performance of those, of those facilities. Definitely, our currencies are not tradable in our continent. I think only the Rand has a little semblance of a tradable currency. Having said that, it behooves us in the continent to ensure that we have policies that will encourage foreign portfolio investment and foreign direct investment. Because if we have policies which will enable investors to come and exit, then the shortage of tradable currency to finance core infrastructure may not be there. Peace and stability is critical to infrastructure development in Africa. The Gambian Minister of Trade, Regional Integration and Employment, Isatu Toure, attests to this fact. I would like to first and foremost uh, congratulate uh, the AFC for their attend your birthday and to extend the greetings of His Excellency President Adam Abaro to Nigeria for the great steps and efforts they have made in getting us out of the 22 years of the dictatorship. <laughs> the Gambia has undergone very serious setbacks for the past 22 years and uh, it was not a very uh, encouraging environment for people to invest or to come to and as a result of that yeah, Gambia was close to the international community and the world over and we began to lose our relevance in terms of investment and development. Thanks to this third regime that came in with the pillars of democracy we are beginning to enjoy appreciative freedom and liberty, and uh, a, a quality that is needed for any investor or develop, developer to come to a country. Despite the challenges confronting Africa's development, Nigeria's acting vice president, Yemi Oshimbajo, is optimistic about the future. Well, I'm, I'm certainly optimistic, and I think um, that Africa is really about its people, it's about its talents, it's about the creative energy that um, we see every day. I mean, look, look at what has happened in the payment systems, the mobile payment systems in Pesa. In Pesa, that's the largest in the world. You know, look at what's happened in Ethiopia. Uh, the infrastructure development in Ethiopia and the great leaps that they are making forward in, in agriculture, you know. So I, 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 think, I, I think Africa is certainly uh, the, 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 the next destination for real development in the world. Everybody knows that where we're next. This coming decade is Africa's decade. It's, it's, it's Africa's time. Session after session, debate after debate, finding a lasting solution to Africa's infrastructure development continues to top discussions. Sometimes the amount of period of time and the risk taken, the quantum of the development costs expended should also be taken into account. Again, as long as the developer has been reasonably efficient in, in developing that project. So we're prepared to accept that there should be a reasonable analysis in terms of the quantum. And those are the sort of benchmarks and criteria that we think within a feeder with representatives of developers and, and sponsors should be on. When it should be paid, the process to get to financial close is incredibly hard. At that point, we have de-risked the project as a developer. Then it is absolutely reasonable for the lenders to agree that they should pay as a significant part, at least, of the development fee. We might be prepared to accept that an element of it can only be paid, perhaps, on commercial operations once we have fully de-risked the project. But in large part, once we've taken the pain to get to financial close, we believe that the fee should be paid. And it is true. Uh, we need developers. However, I think we need to redefine how we see developers and what role they play in the sustainability of the projects. So let's remember what we're all doing project finance. 
You know, at the end of the day, yes, of course, we need to get paid. But we want to build the infrastructure that this continent so much need. So how are we going to do that if the people that have thought through a sustainable project cash in and leave the table at the end of the day? What we don't accept is ridiculously that all these development fees should be paid at financial close, which is the second part of this whole assumption. How much should that be paid? I thought you were lying because you had to think and then you said 80%. <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous high. We're clearly not debating about the necessity for developers. All we debate is whether we should pay them or not. I'd suggest to you we have definitely got to pay them because within the industry they are the rock stars. The developers, the rock stars, we all need rock stars and we need to pay them. And there are a number of reasons why we need to pay them. They are the guys who drive the momentum. Time kills deals. What we need is we need more people, we need more horsepower. Horses cost money, they're gonna get paid for. Give the developer money, let them buy more horses. It's easy. The debates continue, this time on Africa's infrastructure conundrum. What really is the conundrum? The infrastructure conundrum is very simple. Uh, and you've heard these numbers banded around today. You know, something like $100 billion per annum is required uh, to uh, fill the infrastructure financing gap in Africa or, or to finance infrastructure in Africa. And of that, depending on whose numbers you believe, uh, between 50 and 70 billion is actually being provided. So there's a funding gap of uh, 30 to 50 billion. Uh, and the, the, the sad thing is that each year that that gap exists, the, the difference between where we would like to be and where we actually are gets wider and it becomes more difficult uh, to fill that gap. The debate was a tough call for Nigeria's Minister for Works and Housing, Babatunde Fashola, who is supposed to disagree with the motion that the private sector is the panacea for addressing Africa's infrastructure challenges. If I listened to my head, I should have avoided this debate. <laughs> you know, because when Andrew Ali the president of the stock exchange sit down here and I have led the biggest subnational debt debt program to finance public infrastructure. What was I going to say to them now that we need more money? <laughs> the minister did step up to the challenge in the end. To say that electricity and rail the Carnegie's and the JP Morgan's, I think they were collateral investments in infrastructure. They were investments made to further their own businesses rather than build infrastructure. It was investment meant to diminish the capacity of the opponent to compete. So the investment in electricity, as novel as it was, was to kill the paraffin business so that people stop buying oil and lamps. So I, I, I make that argument in opening. I also want to say that experience also doesn't support the argument because here in Nigeria, if you look at projects in power, Shioro Hydro Dam, Kainji Hydro Dam, Jeba Hydro Dam, Third Mainland Bridge, the National Stadium, <laughs> and all of those projects, they were built by public funding. And so experience here doesn't support it the Lekki Link Bridge, the, and, and so on. The president of Nigeria's stock exchange, Aiguji Aig Imohode, was of a different opinion on the matter. It's been very, very difficult and challenging to get African countries and governments to see the private sector as a necessary source of funding and to act and behave in such a manner that would attract that funding. I have been in rooms where the argument has been Certain types of infrastructure just cannot be financed by the private sector. Certain types of things <clears throat> cannot wait for the private sector. But at the end of the day, even those strategic things don't get done. The former president of the Africa Development Bank, Donald Kabaruka, puts all arguments to rest. I know this is a binary debate. We're supposed to say yes or no. <laughs> but I want to say, probably since I'm sitting in the middle, 
there will be a lot of projects for which we need a lot of public money. But so here is my last pitch. But for the government to do this, for me, three things are critical. Number one, number one, it's not simply about building infrastructure. It is infrastructure governance. Do you know the Chinese built a railway in 1971 from Dar es Salaam to Zambia? Now they are back trying to repair it because all these railways being built across Africa, I fear that unless you go back to build the railway schools to train people on maintenance, we'll be back in 10 years rebuilding what we have built. And that sits on the Africa Finance Corporation Summit for 2017. It also coincides with the corporation's 10th year anniversary. Congratulations, AFC. See you at the next summit. I'm Oni Sunday. Thank you for watching.